Um, right. Hello, everyone. Welcome, and uh, thanks for joining us. So we will uh, today. We're setting off our um, experience series of web chats, and uh, along the last few weeks, we've had uh, some amazing people come and talk to us from Inga Solheim, our uh, Arctic explorer, who. Uh, took me down to Antarctica and then he's since taken far more interesting people like Prince Harry to the North Pole. And uh, then we've had Piers Linney from Dragon's Den talking to us about his adventures, but more in the boardroom, I guess. So uh, we're usually uh, doing interesting adventures around the world and uh, doing things physically, but uh, we're now doing it all virtually. And so the experiences are a little bit different for us at the moment and today. Um, so uh, today we've got, uh, a guy with me who uh, I was lucky enough to experience some time marooned on a desert island with him and uh, it's certainly a unique and uh, interesting uh, world that he lives in um, surviving day to day um, and the experience of being shipwrecked so uh, I want to welcome along uh, Tom Williams thanks for joining us today hey how are you thank you for having us Johnny I'm very excellent thank you yeah, you're, you're in Thailand right now right yeah, I'm, I'm on a tropical island, but it's far from deserted. But there yeah, are worse places to be locked down, but I am hankering to be, to be back on a, on a remote island, personally. I, I, I bet. And I think that, uh, yeah, it's certainly a, uh, an interesting time for us all. So we're all just uh, coming to terms with it. And uh, I know there'll be so, so many interesting questions that people have to ask you. So uh, just as a note to everyone, we'll be doing a, a Q&A at the end of this as well. So you can ask Tom some adventures, uh, stories about some of his mad adventures. Um, so well, give us an insight quickly then into how, you, how this journey started for you. I know you've been on some interesting adventures today. And so, yeah, give us that insight into what brought you and led you to where you are today. Um, I mean, it, it certainly wasn't all exciting and adventurous. Uh, I did a few cool things when I was younger. I, I became a dive master and I worked as a snowboard instructor and then I think I did what was expected of me, what my mother expected, which was go and get yourself a nice stable office job. And I found myself after all this fun working in Maidenhead in a trading estate selling software. And the hat felt very uncomfortable. And so um, I drunkenly agreed to walk to the North Pole with a friend and spend the next year and a half in Maidenhead having this kind of light at the end of the tunnel to, uh, to escape to. And walked to the North Pole and had this great adventure and then fell back into the same mistakes of working, um, chasing the money and, and, and uh, not necessarily fulfilling my dreams. Um, yeah, I did many more adventures after that. I lived in Chile, I, I did lots of uh, kayaking in Patagonia, I sailed 8,000 miles from Canada to Chile and cycled over the Andes and yada, yada, yada. And I'd always had this childhood dream to be marooned on a desert island. And I just found it was something that really was not very represented. Um, so I went about finding what companies were offering this, um, learned from them, and, uh, and finally, this time I think I have escaped the rat race and, uh, and set up Desert Island Survival uh, three and a half years ago. Wow, that's uh, yeah, certainly a journey. I mean, I'm intrigued. So how did you get from the North Pole to going to uh, a desert island? What was that trip like, um, your expedition up there? Yeah, I mean, it's obviously, it's, it's different climates, but similar disciplines. So um, it, the expedition management and the expedition planning taught me an awful lot of the, the, the responsibilities and things that you have to make sure are in place when you are running a desert island survival expedition. There, there has to be a safety net and you have to be very organized and have your checklist. We may not appear it when you're on our trip, Johnny, but um, there is behind the scenes. Um, but no, that was, that was an amazing, it was, I, I, I summed that up as the best and worst thing I've ever done. I think we live our daily lives with this kind of oscillation of, of highs and lows and, you know, people might go and get drunk or watch a horror film to live this. Um, when you're on a desert island, it's, it's certainly more broad. And when we were at the North Pole, it was this unbelievable highs and lows of euphoria. And, um, so what, what was a day-to-day -day life like on that trip to the pole then? So how many of you were, were you in a team and... You were sleeping together in in a in close confinement yeah. in a tent. How how did the how, and how long did it all last? Um, so we trained for two years. Um, we uh, we were a team of three. They were uh, a couple at the time, um, and we walked. Uh, we spent a month on the ice racing racing to the North Pole, um, and we didn't work on a twenty four hour day because it was perpetual daylight. 
So we would, we would work on a 28 to 30 hour day. We'd walk for two hours, stop for five minutes, walk for two hours, stop for five minutes. Uh, just continue this, this kind of monotony on this, this blank white canvas. Um, and then put our, hand, uh, put, our hand, put our tent up, pass out, or get some food in us, pass out, wake up, repeat. Um, we ended up, we, uh, we won the race and we missed the world record by two hours and 20 minutes after a month out there. But it was still, um, yeah, still good. Yeah, that must be uh, quite a, a life-changing experience. I always wonder whether it's about the, the physical or the, the, the mental challenge. Like, wh which one is it? <laughs> Definitely mental, 100% mental. And we, we, we trained, obviously, for, for two years, building up our physical abilities, but we taught ourselves to only really give up when, um, when you physically can't do any more. They use the analogy of if you're hanging from a tree, and you were to let go and fall to your certain death, you wouldn't just give up. You would hold on until your last fingers slipped. And that's how we approach kind of every day and, and, and our walking. And in fact, on three different occasions, I fell asleep walking. I just fell to the snow, completely fell asleep. And we, we conditioned ourselves to be able to just go right to that limit um, of, of only, only ever giving up physically, not mentally. And so... so more. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that that's... Uh a good uh, mental attitude to have and one to understand in all challenges I guess you're faced with is uh, your, your body gives up a lot later than uh, you think it will I guess. Yeah, you can always go a little more yeah and I think when you when you do something like that and you step so broadly out of your comfort zone and then you come back in um, many other things in life become more manageable um, it's almost like that elasticity of, of, of that experience and you can rationalize things a lot better than I, I, I personally feel. So I mean we're all going through a very strange time where we're all isolated from the rest of the world. Like we're stuck in our homes. We might get the most exciting thing we do all week is uh, get to go to the shops and buy some food and see other human beings briefly. Um, although we have to stay two meters away from them. I mean, you're, you're the isolation expert. No, what like, what do you, do you mind isolation? How do you feel about it? Like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I quite like my own company quite a lot. I'm, I'm with my wife and, and kid here, which is wonderful to have so much family time, but not being able to put our child in school, it, it is draining. I was woken up at 4.30 this morning and I'm very tired. Um, but no, I, I think there are many aspects of our island expeditions that you can apply to this, um, this challenge that we're all experiencing right now. Um, I think one is to, to try and have structure and routine to our days. We, we normally have our, maybe our commute or our time at the gym and the office. And without that, we now just kind of drift. And I think it's really important to compartmentalize your day and to try and implement those structures that we no longer have ruling us. I think that's, that's really good for our, for our mindset. Um, another thing um, is um, I think to disconnect. Like we, there's a lot of bad news and a lot of just general kind of chatter out there and it can be um, overwhelming for us. And I think just to spend two hours a day when we say, right, from two to four, my computer, my phone is off, I'm going to read a book. Um, maybe I'm going to have a go at mindfulness or meditation or, uh, or, or learn a new skill. Um, I think we'll never be so time rich again. And we can flip this on its head as a positive of this is a unique opportunity to be time rich and maybe to learn a new skill set or something like that. So I guess you could take that from it um, as well. Yeah, I mean, but how do you, in these circumstances, when you're on an island, like things aren't going to plan, how do you, like, how do you keep morale up, I guess? Like you, you're, you're there with a, with, and again, same as people are now, you're there with your close friends or your flatmate or your partner, but like things get up and down. Like on an island, like you've got no real release. Like, so how do you motivate a team and things that just feel like they're going to share. Well, it's interesting to say about the partner and one of the rules we had at the North Pole was say nice things and it sounds really cheesy but we we had this um, rule that we would always express gratitude you know every time someone did anything for you uh, we would just say thank you thank you thank you and without being you know uh, sycophantic and I think just just being grateful to each other and being understanding to each other in these kind of closed environments is really good but I think on an island, um, when you're certainly with a tribe, um, patience, yeah, patience is, is a big one. Um, and um, going back to those other points, it, it's routine. If you, if you have these structures, it can, it can really help. If you're solo on an island, it's a whole, whole different challenge. I think 
you've got to find a nice volleyball and cut your hand and uh, <laughs> and draw a little face on there and call him Wilson. <laughs> well, I mean, that is another thing is like, obviously um, you've done trips with people where you're managing small group dynamics of people surviving together, but how, isolation on your own, that's, that's, that's a full new level. Like isolating with a few people, like, and you've got, you, you can have conversation, but how do you not go crazy <laughs> when you're on your own? We genuinely do. We're, we're such social animals and we're, we're pre-programmed to live as a tribe. And uh, it is detrimental to us. You will suffer the consequences. Many of us can't go for more than, um, you know, a three to six month period without, without human contact. Um, and genuinely things like talking to yourself are good for you in those situations. On our expedition, after five days of training, we have three days where um, you have to survive with the skills that we've taught you. And we do give people the option to do that bit solo. And, and when was the last time you spent just three days without talking to another human? It's, I mean, that in itself can be quite an uh, introspective and profound uh, experience for people. I, I guess that that's, again, it goes back to this, people have this perception that all these adventures that people do um, uh, are about how well they train the Olympians, the physically fit, but it, it really is this, this mind game that you're playing. So, so can, I guess anyone can really come and do quite a lot of these experiences as long as the, the power is in the mind, though. Absolutely. I mean, I mean we, we make this accessible to people who have never even been camping before. Um, we start it off as very much survival light and we spend five days empowering people till they feel ready to, to really take on the, the true survival situation with little more than a machete. But ten, it, as, as you say, the most important thing is the mindset people come into this with. Um, and in, in true survival situations, there's numerous uh, accounts of, um, of, for example, there's these uh, sailors um, who a ship went down and they had two life rafts, identical situations with uh, same amount of men, same amount of rations. One was the captain who could not get over the loss of the boat going down. The other was the first mate. The captain capitulated. The first mate put in routines and they, they looked after themselves and he played morale games and, and kept everyone talking. Um, by the time they were rescued after just 12 days, the, the captain died the, the final day and the rest of the um, uh, the, the first mate was was absolutely fine, and it's just there's some, there's some extra, extraordinary examples of um, of how much mindset in exactly the same circumstance can play out to to one person perishing and others surviving. Yeah, that that really does show the reality, I guess. I mean, so when you're on, on an island, is there contact with the app? Like, how's how's you how do you get off if you need to? Like, what's your uh, way of getting in contact with the outside world when you really are <laughs> in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Ocean? Yeah, we, we use Iridium sat phones. Um, so we, we, we have that, that contact if we need to. And we, um, we have like seven different numbers that we will call and, and degrees of escalation if we can't get hold of the first one. <laughs> um, luckily, we've never really got past number two. Um, and yeah, no, we have our uh, evacuation strategies in place and ready. Um, and when the solo person goes into isolation, we also have them ping us every, every 24 hours to know that they they are okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they can't call you if something goes wrong with them. So I guess, yeah, you, you, you'll find out <laughs> soon. Um, so, I mean, you've done trips in, in just off Panama in the Pacific. Like, um, I know that's where um, Bear Grylls, the island was filmed out there. I mean, is that show as it looks on TV? Like, what, what does that really look like? Um. I can't speak so much that actually the, 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 the ones with the contestants in, as far as I'm aware, that they are relatively correct. Um, I don't want to badmouth Bear or, or Ed Stafford or any of the, uh, the other um, <laughs> presenters out there, but there is a lot of fabrication. Let's just say they've normally got a supply of Snickers and a nice warm tent that they can, uh, they can get themselves into when they need to, and a bottle <laughs> of rum. <laughs> So, I mean, what's the worst situation you've been in? I mean, like, the, and I feel that a very simple situation um, can get out of hand very quickly when you don't have the comforts of the modern world around you. So, where, what, can you tell me when it's really all gone a bit wrong? Yeah, 
uh, I mean, there was a horrible moment on my, uh, still learning the ropes. I mean, I'm always going to be learning these skills. It's very much a rule of 10,000 hours. Um, and I, on my third expedition, I was, uh, it started to rain. We, we went in, in wet season when it's quite a hard time. There's lots of insects. We don't normally go in the wet season, but it was a, a private group we wanted to. Um, and I, uh, I was cutting some bamboo late at night to reinforce the shelter on the very first night and my machete slipped. Uh, it was extremely sharp, being sharpened before the expedition, and it, it went through my uh, flexor tendon on my finger. Um, and uh, instantly, the second it happened, I knew that I'd cut really deep and it was serious. Uh, and I mean, I almost went into shock. I pretended everything was fine. I have to remain stoic. And uh, I've got eight people who, are, who have just got into the situation. They need the trust and dependability that their instructor has everything covered. And I had to just pretend everything was fine. We always have an assistant instructor on our expeditions since that trip. This trip did not have one. So I was in a position, I, I had to, I popped several codeines. I went to sleep in my hammock, fretting. Do I abandon the expedition? Do we continue with it? Um, luckily, one of the, uh, the individuals was also a, um, a doctor. So he, uh, he wrapped it up. I went and got it sutured at the local clinic the next day. I got to watch England, Sweden World Cup. So there are merit to this as one, two, no. Um, I may have timed that on purpose. Um, yeah. and, uh, and then I, I carried on with the expedition and I was doing a bow drill demonstration, a friction fire. And, and whilst I was doing that, I, could feel, I felt the stick pop and uh, blood started dripping down my arm, dripping off my elbow, almost putting out my fire as I was going. I was like, I must continue. Um, so that, that eight days was just horrific. I really had to dig quite deep on that one. Wow. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and I'm intrigued because you, you're going to places that are pretty remote, not people like, I mean, my experience of going to these third world countries and places that aren't really set up for tourists, there's, there's some weird stuff going down. I mean, have you ever felt kind of in fear of your life and felt that there's men with guns or like drug smugglers coming through the night like what's going on on these desert islands <laughs> like uh, i mean I like think it's well, but we we have like a very extensive checklist of uh, requirements for our islands um we look at it as the goldilocks zone where it has to be near enough to tourism um that we can get there with our clients but um and there's a clinic but not too close that you've got you know tourists turning up on the beach and uh, um, and the illusion of being marooned ruined um in and when we take those considerations, another one is things like pirates. We can't use the southern Philippines. There's some beautiful islands down there, but we just simply can't go there because there's, there's still piracy and terrorist cells there. Um, and in Panama, we do also have to be mindful. We have to make sure the police know that we're there because if they see a fire on, on the beach, they will assume that perhaps that's uh, narcos who are trafficking up from, from Mexico because almost every single route is, is taken across the Central American isthmus. So, um, so yeah, it's, we, we've been fortunate enough never to, we have had the police turn up with AK-47s. Yeah. It was, there was a little, little bit of a standoff, but they, they, were, they were fine. One of the castaways gave them cigarettes and off they went. But um, in general, I imagine no, the we, police there aren't quite like the Bobbies on the Beat in London. They feel a little <laughs> bit more intimidating. With huge guns. Um, but uh, again, that was quite early on. But no, we, we, we're, we're now, we're very particular now on the islands. So that's, those occurrences do not uh, inconvenience. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you've, you've set a business up out of this, but what's this experience like for a client? Like what's that actual, run me through how that works. I mean, I was, guess I would say that Oh, about 85% of our clients go on to say it was the best experience of their life. Like then we do get ridiculously um, gratifying responses from, from our castaways. I think, I think we, we live this life now where we shut ourselves off in our, in our houses or in our cubicles at work where we you know, commute with our headphones in. As I said, we're, we're very much social animals and we live within these concrete jungles we, we've created with us, almost these prisons which are so unnatural to how we live just 10, 15 generations ago as a primal human in a tribe surrounded by nature. And I think when you take people out of that and we do live connected with, with a group of people 
immersed in nature, something really profound happens to us. And even though there is hardship on our trips, like you're going to get some sunburn and you're going to get some mosquito bites, people really afterwards feel like a weight's been lifted off their shoulders. Like they, they really feel like they've almost reconnected with that primal human again. And uh, I think that's, that's what I, I love about it and, and, and seeing, seeing that happen to people. I've also seen people hungry on the final three days and this kind of shiftiness in their eyes where they see a flicker in the water and like they've awoken something to eat within them that's been sleeping for so long. Um, yeah, I think mean, that's, that's really cool. So, so how are you going on all these trips? How much time do you spend stuck on a desert island on an average uh, year? Um, I, I've got a wife and kid and the rule is five trips a year. So I run five expeditions and I also do some scouting to find new islands as well. Um, but no, we have other instructors. We have a chap called Tom McElroy, who's amongst the best bushmen on the planet. He, he's, when you watch Ed Stafford first man out, he's the guy behind the camera handing Ed the, the right stick to rub together. And he's the power behind the throne there. Um, and our, our, our instructors, yeah, the ridiculously talented bunch. He's taught me um, so much of, of what I've learned. Um, that wasn't the question. I just digressed. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, what, what's the... Uh... What's a day in the life like though when you go so you, you're you're arriving from an airport somewhere normal and then transitioning to a, a crazy location in the middle of nowhere where you take everything away from people yeah I mean in places like Tonga it gets more and more rickety and remote and the further you go down that rabbit hole into a smaller and smaller island um, we, we like to try and find a, a nice kind of boutique hotel to start and finish in um, a four-star hotel becomes an eight-star hotel when you come off the island um and uh and yeah we, we start that first day with an expedition briefing everyone meeting each other and the next morning we load up into the speedboats and head out to the desert islands and it feels alien like it just feels this is the land of the crabs um this is not home and that first day we build the shelter and it's amazing the psychology of when you get a roof above your head how much suddenly the next morning you wake up and like, oh yeah this is this is my home um, and, uh, and yeah, for the next five days, we, we sleep in hammocks. We, um, we learn the skills together. We, we have a lot of fun. We pass a bottle of rum around. We, we play games. Um, we teach people how to make fire by friction, how to open coconuts, catch fish until the final three days where they basically have a, a ration of water, a sat phone, a medikit, um, a, a machete and, uh, and off they go to to get that fire by friction and to build the shelter and survive. Then, well, I mean, <laughs> give, give us like some ideas on. So, if we really are stuck on a desert island, where where do we start? We, we're dumped there. We we've, can we we've just survived off the the plane crash. We've crawled to the island. We've got a few of us there together that have survived. Yeah. Well, and, and you're leading the troop. What happens next? Well, the first thing you do is we all turn out our pockets and we see what we've got to work with. Hopefully someone's a smoker. Um, if, if they're not a smoker, hopefully one of them's short-sighted and they've got a strong pair of bifocal lenses and we can get a fire going with those. Um, it, I, they, I feel like that, that's, uh, does that really happen? Is that quite an easy thing to get a fire started with some glasses? It's the easiest way. I mean, there's lots of other ways of making magnification fires. You can use the bottom of a bottle. Um, you can use a, a bag full of water. Um, you can... Um, but, but yeah, glasses will, will always work better, better than most. Um, if, if I'm there, then we're okay. We're going to be able to get a friction fire because one of the nice things for us is we have the same species of, of wood um, all over the world. They tend to be drift seeds. And so they populate um, every desert island really within the Tropic of Capricorn and Cancer. So we can find some hibiscus and we can make a hand drill fire pretty easily. Um, but if, we, uh, if it is a, a group of people who might not necessarily have those, those skill sets, then yeah, glasses are your best, your best way of, uh, of getting a fire. Um, and then the most important thing you can have is a knife. And if there's not a wreckage with a bit of metal that we can use, um, then there are a few options. There's a reason in Castaway that one of the FedEx boxes had uh, ice skates, because without having a knife, Tom Hanks would have been absolutely screwed. Um, <laughs> And um, but you can you can break clamshells. Um, one of my favourites is is bamboo. If you just split bamboo, you get a razor sharp edge. Um, with that, you can obviously use broken glass. Um, a knife opens up many other doors, as does fire. Yeah, I mean, so 
you you were there you've managed to do that, that now how are you going about getting food like when and are you and and what's the survive are you killing stuff or are you just finding stuff on the ground like what's how does this work yeah, I guess like all civilizations, you start low and you work your way up. If you've got fire that opens up doors, you can start to have things like shellfish, which are normally fairly abundant, at least um, hermit crabs and limpets and other crustaceans. Um, and if you don't, then you're going to be, first and foremost, you've got coconuts almost every time, which are obviously highly calorific um, and are going to keep you, keep you going and they obviously give you water as well, as well as um, they're basically an energy drink. They're full of electrolytes. Um, and there's lots of different wild edibles. If you know the right plants, you generally are going to be okay. But you can't take chances on that. So as, as you remember, Johnny, there's an apple on an island in Panama called the Manchinil or the Death Apple, which has enough poison to kill 20 men. I remember you were walking several <laughs> meters, of, giving them wide berths as you uh, saw them. They weren't jumping. Um, and so it's very important that you know the wild edibles. There's a, there's a full test that you go through from rubbing it on your skin to then putting a tiny bit into your mouth and waiting three hours and then swallowing a bit waiting three hours there's many a long-winded process to understand whether something is edible um it can be quite hard to do that when you're ravenous and you're presented with a very much biblical apple um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then what's the what's the easiest uh, animal to get hold of how are you gonna get really get some uh, so, something exciting uh, I mean, if, if fish are exciting to some, you can you can make various. Every every island now comes with about ten thousand plastic bottles, sadly, and it's very easy to cut one end off um, and make uh, an inverse trap. Um, and you can you can use uh, you know crushed up snails for bait, or even in a real pinch, you can shit in it. You can defecate in there and use that as as bait. Um, and so you can make a bunch of those in rock pools and have a primitive fish trap. Um, uh, if you, depending on what, what you have on the island, we can also make a snare from hibiscus bark and use a coconut as bait. Um, you can catch ground birds that way, monitor lizards. Um, um, we, in Tonga, we're lucky enough to have um, coconut crabs, which we, they're critically endangered because they are so easy to catch and they're truly delicious. I mean, it's a four and a half kilo, one meter wide, uh, walking 10 times more delicious than a lobster. So we don't actually kill them. We'd show you how to, how to catch them. And if you can bring us one bound in isolation, we're going to give you a ration of you know, rice and some, some good treats and food in return in exchange for that coconut crab. But yeah, it all depends on where you are. Um, well, I guess we're going to go to a few uh, Q&As now as well to give you a bit of an insight into what other people are asking and uh, thinking about. But so if, you, if you could bring five items with you, um, to be marooned on a desert island with you, what would they be? <laughs> um, I mean, um, can I have a sat phone? Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, knife is always my number one number one choice. Um, a hammock, <laughs> because you can't, um, it, because if it comes with built-in shelter and having a, a dry and, and easy place to sleep is is invaluable. Um, can I have a reverse osmosis pump to filter the sea? <laughs> <laughs> These are real luxuries. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, I'll absolutely have my sat phone. Um, uh, and a cigarette lighter. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess that makes it... So you think you can thrive with that, really? That would be your, uh, um, yeah, your survival kit. Um, so what, what about a luxury item? <laughs> like a, a packed Kindle with a solar charger. Would, would, I mean, it, I guess it does get. So you, you're doing something like sixty days a year on a desert island. Does it? Do you not get bored? Like, how do you manage that? I, I mean, during the expedition with with the clients, the first five days, I don't stop. I mean, it is truly exhausting and it's it's wonderful. But once that those five days of working at like a you know 100 percent capacity are over, I need the first day of when people are in isolation just to decompress, and then I have two days. To um, to practice skills um, and to read my read my book, it, I, I I would double that time every time. I, I absolutely, I I'm almost seldom happier than when I'm on an island. Wow, <laughs> I guess that that's the the situation we're all trying to understand now. I think that often people need <laughs> to get back to a bit more peace and calm and yeah, 
be a bit more mindful, like you say. So you get a great amount of time to do that, I guess. Um, yeah. So what would you say your the three most vital survival skills? I mean, it's, it feels like a bit of a cop out, but your your brain is the the big one. Your brain is that survival Swiss Army knife. The skills and knowledge that you have internally are going to make the difference between between life and death. And also, just generally having that mindset of optimism or belief that you are going to be rescued again makes a difference of um, when you when you read stories of, of many other survival tales um uh what was three three other sorry the, the, your skill set so what are the skill sets you need to I mean, it's, not die it's, <laughs> I, I, on on top of that so specific skill sets of um of, of making fire and knowing knowing where to source water and knowing where to source food really it, it all it all is entirely knowledge really um i, I mean that the, making a friction fire is is a nuance as, as you'll can you'll uh, i can tell you that took me a while <laughs> it, it looks very straightforward but there's so many idiosyncrasies to making um to making a friction fire a bow drill fire it's just one of those things you've got to practice 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 um with a bit of guidance and, and knowing that the kit is right before before it's going to work for you Sure. Um, and then, uh, which desert island has been your most enjoyable? Um, I will always love the, the Panama island because it was where this whole thing was, was born and it's where we, um, it will always be my nostalgic island. Um, it, it, it's, it's very special. Uh, the island in Tonga, if I, you know, if I had to choose one to, to go to, it, it is the Tonga one just because it's just, I mean, there's more um, layers of turquoise and, and neon that you knew existed. It's truly stunning. And we, we swim with humpback whales on the first day as well. So it's like, it's, it's just a, a double bucket list experience. It's a beast to get to. Um, we mostly only get Australians and Kiwis make the journey because it's about 35 hours from the UK. But overall, the Tonga, the Tonga Island is the one, the one for me. Um, and then uh, I guess it's a good one to finish on. So what are you, um, oh, hang on. So where are we? Um, what, what personality or mindset shift takes place um, for those which return to a normal lifestyle after this adventure? It's a great question. Um, so we, I had a guy called Jason who um, is like 27, a little rebellious, um, who uh, just wanted to get drunk and didn't want to learn the skills. His friend had suggested coming on this trip. And afterwards, he ended up making significant life change. He's ended up, he's run four marathons um, since. He's now uh, like become, he's now working his passion. He's becoming an uh, environmentalist. Um, we've seen people can use this time for, for kind of a very, it's the first time you get to really step off that hamster wheel and have that introspection for a lot of people. And so they really reassess and readdress their lives and what they want their lives to be like. And I think that that's, that's really cool. I also had another guy who ended up losing something like 25 kilos after the, after the trip and becoming just super motivated. So we've seen some real like motivational changes in people. That's wow. um, it's yeah. been really nice. Um, oh, there's one more here. So I'll, um, which, uh, well, it says which three books, but what, what influenced you on the founding of the Desert Island Survival? Like they, they said, which three books? Is it, was it a book? Was it a, a moment? Was it, what, what, what inspired you? And, uh, I mean, I, um, there's, there's a few books that I've read that, that really did it for me. There's one, it's, it's slightly different, but I've always enjoyed adventure books. Um, uh, Paddles of the Amazon by Don, Don Starkle is one of my favorite uh, adventure books to, to read. Um, 467 Days about a Mexican fisherman who has to survive at sea. Um, it's the longest ever sea survival. Uh, I really, really recommend that. That, that had a big impact on me as well um and ju it's just yeah that book I, I remember you telling me about that sounds absolutely fascinating and i think for me as as a child i've always i've always been passionate about nature and um i used to watch coral reefs on on, on you know bbc and, and never realized that that could become possible and to, to you know to swim with those and then later on you start to become jaded and you're like oh i want the best coral reefs and i think part of the pursuit for this as well was to get to parts of the world and find nature that's untouched. It's, it's very difficult these days to get to places where humans don't really have much interaction. And obviously the plastic debris will always be everywhere now. 
um, this will be the age of the plastic. But I think the big catalyst for me was not just the survival, but that nature immersion and that, that desire to try and find the last corners of the earth where, where nature still rules supreme. And that was a big thing for me. Yeah. Well, I mean, thanks so much for your insights today. It's uh, been certainly very interesting. And I know that uh, a lot of our clients and uh, are keen to come out and try your adventures. So I hope they'll be back online soon. And uh, I'd imagine with the, the social distancing, you're in the middle of nowhere. So hopefully they'll be back online sooner than, uh, than most. So we're, we should be able to uh, get some people out to some desert island soon. Absolutely, yeah. It's a holiday that doesn't rely on, on, on bars and restaurants and, and traditional hotels. So, so long as we don't have 14 day quarantines upon arrival, then, then we'll be ready to get this up and running again. I, I, I absolutely can't wait. Brilliant. Oh, well, thanks again, Tom. And uh, uh, yeah, really appreciate it. You take care. Cheers, Johnny. Love to chat with you. Go well. Uh, cheers, Bye.